just black out what they didn't want and then rescan it. And uh, I'm going to show you how they do that. When I say they cover something up with black, this is what I mean. Oh, oh what do we got here, NASA? Whoa! There's numerous photos that they do this in. Numerous. I can't even count them. You know, look at some of this stuff. But this is what's going on. This is what NASA's doing. And then they release this stuff to the public. This uh, is from the Cassini probe. This is Titan. Uh, it's, I, I don't even believe that this is here, first of all. Okay? There's definitely something behind it that's emitting all types of light. Now, if you can tell me how this is not... Look, they just covered part of it. I don't even believe that this is... I believe that this is just cut in. It's too much of a perfect circle. They used like a circle tool and just cut this out and pasted it. As far as I'm concerned. But this nonsense... This is what I mean when I tell you that NASA's blacking something out. This is so while we all went about our lives yesterday, we came very close to a catastrophic event here on planet Earth, and we didn't know about it. It turns out we just missed getting hit by an asteroid, a piece of solid rock roughly the size of a 10-story building. Now, I say just missed because it came within 45,000 miles of us. That's a lot closer than the moon is, and scientists say way too close for something that big. Had it struck, again, they, the people who tell us about these things, say the impact could have had the force of a 1,000 Hiroshima strength atomic bombs over a huge area of the Earth. There are quite a few theories about how the world might end. Uh, for example, it's been suggested that there could be a big solar storm which would take the world out. Well, we get solar storms from time to time, um, and they're a bit troublesome if you're an astronaut. Indeed, not good news if you're an astronaut. But down here on Earth, we are protected by the Earth's magnetosphere, the effects of the magnetic field. And OK, solar storms can disturb that. They can produce currents in power lines that sometimes cause trouble. Um, they can take out satellites, stop satellites working. So they could affect our GPS and any telephone calls that go by satellite, for example. But they're not going to end the world. Every so often, asteroids do hit the Earth. We know we can see some of the craters. There's Meteor Crater, or Barringer Crater, as it's properly called, in Arizona. And there's traces of a very big crater, partly on the Mexican Yucatan Peninsula and partly under the sea. That big crater was the result of an impact about 65 million years ago. And it's thought that's what caused the extinction of the dinosaurs and many other things. So a big thing like that could cause us some problems. Broadly speaking, what happens is when something big like that impacts, it not only makes a crater, it kicks up a whole lot of dust into the atmosphere. And the atmosphere cuts out the sunlight and that stops crops growing and foods fail and there's starvation and so on. So that is something we need to look out for, and we are looking out for. There is an array of telescopes all around the world monitoring the sky night after night, uh, actually monitoring about a thousand potentially hazardous objects, things that might come and hit the Earth one day. As they monitor them, they discover that the vast majority of them won't, that as they get the orbit more accurately, they see it'll miss the Earth. But if there was something coming to hit the Earth, we'd get two or three years' notice. And even with today's technology, we could divert it so that it didn't impact the Earth. And there's research going on all the time which will improve that technology so that it gets easier to divert an incoming asteroid. We've got no knowledge of any big asteroid coming to hit us. Some of the techniques they use to deflect an asteroid, um, one of them is to paint it white all over, which means it reflects sunlight very well and the sunlight bouncing off the asteroid will push it sideways. From Plato's Republic was the idea that population should be controlled and unwanted life should be disposed of like trash. In other words, that some were worthy of life and others weren't. This is a concept that comes through in Darwin's ideas about survival of the fittest. If we are evolving towards individual perfection by natural means, that would mean that collectively we are in fact evolving towards a utopian society of perfect men and women. However, in that case, those with perceived poor genetic material would be slowing that collective evolution, and so the whole process could be accelerated by getting rid of those who are not made of the right stuff. 
The end goal of a utopian society of purebred humans would justify the means of getting rid of the lesser ones. Remember that the full title of Origin of Species was On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or the Preservation of Favoured Races in the Struggle for Life. One of the major influences on Darwin was a man called Thomas Malthus, who received the blessings of French deist Jean-Jacques Rousseau and famous Scottish philosopher David Hume. Incidentally, David Hume has a prominent statue on Edinburgh's Royal Mile, and if you look at the back of it, you will see this sun god symbol. Now, Thomas Malthus authored a document called The Essay on the Principle of Population, where he concluded that, amongst other things, society should adopt policies that prevent the human population from growing disproportionately larger than the food supply. Malthus, again finding a route in Plato's Republic, proposed genocide to make sure this didn't happen. Specifically, he thought to target the poor. He says, Instead of recommending cleanliness to the poor, we should encourage contrary habits. In our towns, we should make the streets narrower, crowd more people into the houses and court the return of the plague. In the country, we should build our villages near stagnant pools and particularly encourage settlement in all marshy and unwholesome situations. But above all, we should reprobate specific remedies for ravaging diseases and those benevolent but much mistaken men who have thought they were doing a service to mankind by projecting schemes for the total extirpation of particular disorders. Malthus believed that by such methods, the undesirables in society could be effectively culled. He said regarding children, We are bound in justice and honour formally to disclaim the right of the poor to support. To this end, I should propose a regulation be made declaring that no child born should ever be entitled to parish assistance. The illegitimate infant is comparatively speaking of little value to society, as others will immediately supply its place. All children beyond what would be required to keep up the population to this desired level must necessarily perish, unless room be made for them by the deaths of grown persons. The logic behind the idea that those who serve society least should be destroyed was echoed under Darwinism in the survival of the fittest. The individual is lost in the collective. Again, the end of a utopian society justifies the means of killing the poor and the weak. This naturally leads to another idea put forward by Plato that people who are perceived to have pure genetic materials should be encouraged to breed amongst themselves to produce a race of supermen fit for ruling over the masses. This selective breeding is called eugenics. Eugenics actually found its Enlightenment era origin in Charles Darwin's cousin, Sir Francis Galton. Galton regurgitated the thoughts of Plato in his work, Hereditary Genius, which was basically a racist tirade advocating a system of selective breeding for purposes of providing more suitable races or strains of blood a better chance of prevailing over the less suitable. In other words, trying to artificially speed the upward course that evolutionists thought we were naturally already on. In truth, selective breeding had been practiced for some time amongst the elite. Inbreeding was commonplace amongst the ruling class to protect the genetic purity of their future stock. Galton merely took this idea and popularized it as a legitimate science. This very same tradition was in fact practiced by Charles Darwin himself in hopes of maintaining a genetic superiority in his own bloodline. Darwin married the youngest granddaughter of his maternal father. Researcher Ian Taylor reveals the outcome of this project. Darwin's idea of inbreeding to produce superior stock can be seen to be a complete disaster in the case of his own ten children. Of the ten, one girl Mary died shortly after birth. Another girl, Anne, died at the age of ten years. His eldest daughter, Henrietta, had a serious and prolonged breakdown at fifteen in 1859. Three of his six sons suffered such frequent illness that Darwin regarded them as semi-invalids, while his last son, Charles Jr., was born mentally retarded and died in 1858, nineteen months after his birth. Science has shown that inbreeding actually leads to speedier destruction of the genetic code rather than evolution because of something called biological mutations, which is why so-called purebred dogs are in fact more prone to health problems than mixes. The errors in their genetic code multiply as they are bred amongst themselves over long periods. But where true science fails, the religion of scientism continues stubbornly on. If they had followed God's wisdom in Leviticus 18, they would have heeded the warning not to commit incest and they would have been all the better for it. In their own human wisdom, however, they persisted and reaped the consequences. The idea of eugenics continued to be promoted in the scientific community for a long time afterwards. At the turn of the 20th century in 1901, the Statistics Department of London's University College became the headquarters for the Eugenics Education Society. Motivated by Galton's vision of a future utopia, ruled by a genetically engineered pure elite, the Eugenic Society grew into a successful political movement and would eventually inspire Hitler's Holocaust against the Jews. Population control is still a big issue for the elite today. 
As recently as May 24, 2009, the Times reported of a secret meeting of billionaires held in New York City, including the likes of Bill Gates and Oprah Winfrey, where the number one issue on the agenda was how to cap the global... washing up and as it washes up it's bringing all these jelly things what is that it's all over State warns on EMP. There's no help coming. Oh, this was interesting. Washington. Arizona Governor Jan Brewer has signed legislation to require the state's Department of Emergency and Military Affairs to prepare materials outlining what citizens need to know to deal with either a natural or man-made electromagnetic pulse event that could knock out the vulnerable electric electrical grid system over a wide geographical region. But if this isn't another red alert for you, I don't know what else to tell you. The legislation SB 1476 was introduced by Senator David Farnsworth. Uh, it includes the type and quantity of food, water, and medical supplies that each person should stockpile in case an EMP occurs over the U.S. What? The legislation, however, doesn't require actual hardening of the grid within the state. Unreal. And, uh, Russia sanctions, I almost read the NBA bans, Russia sanctions not tough enough yet, analysts say. Well, if they get any quote-unquote tougher, they're going to be really attacking Putin. And that's just going to make him mad. I mean, it's not doing anything. It's actually creating another financial system to fall back on when this one collapses. So, do you believe in global warming? Uh, yes, I do. Global warming is a bad way to phrase it. Do I believe in climate change? Yes. Yeah, to an extent, I do. Yes. 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 Why do you believe global warming? Um, because there is scientifically valid proof that global warming exists. Because uh, it's getting hotter and colder. Like right. I've been in Georgia my whole life, and we've never really seen snow the way we've seen it in the past two years. Yeah, so. Because I think that humans have a, an effect on the planet that has been observed through scientific reasoning. I mean, it's been proven. Like, scientific evidence shows that global warming is real. So, plenty of studies that indicate over the last 30 years what the shit's going on if we're not too careful. Like, no, we're going to ruin our Earth. It's self-evident, the ice is melting, we're all doomed, we're all gonna die. Matthew, it's uh, August the 30th, 2016, and uh, I'm looking up at the sun, and you can see that object now by the sun. See the chemtrails? All the chemtrails that are going to be covering this heavenly body up there by the sun. You can see that now, can't you guys? There it is. There's the heavenly object. This is what they're hiding, guys, up there in the sky. 100% proof now, guys. Can you see that, guys? 100% proof. There's an object up there that's been hidden by the chemtrails. You see that, guys? 100%. 100% in the sky, guys. This is what the government are hiding. This is what they're chemtrailing, guys. You can see these chemtrails everywhere. they're hiding. There's the heavenly object guys. <laughs> there it is guys. See the chemtrail? This is what they're hiding up there guys. There's the sun. Or the artificial sun or something else. I don't know what it is but there is the heavenly object. Chemtrails.
There is your 100% proof that they're hiding a celestial body up there, guys. The time is now half past 12, quarter to one in the UK, north, east, and east. There it is, guys. I'm Matthew, and I'm showing you the heavenly body that's by the sun, guys. This object, when it goes, um, when it comes to like uh, two o'clock, five o'clock, it comes from the right hand, it goes to the left hand side. Come to the left hand side. At the moment, it's on the right hand side. It moves like a comet. This object moves like a comet in the sky, guys. Time to believe. There it is, 100%. 100% there is the object, guys. There it is. No lens flare. No sun dog. Just the object, 100%. And thank you for subscribing to my channel. I'm using my HD Canon camcorder. I'm using a solar lens, but it's a proper lens. It's just a normal lens with the solar lens, so it doesn't cause the sun to uh, be so 100% bright. It takes a lot of the glare away. And with the glare away, there it is, the hidden object. You can see the chemtrail. Uh, some of the older stuff, they used to take like a black Sharpie marker, just black out what they didn't want, and then rescan it. And uh, I'm going to show you how they do that. When I say they cover something up with black, this is what I mean. Oh, oh what do we got here, NASA? Whoa! There's numerous photos that they do this in. Numerous. I can't even count them. You know, look at some of this stuff. But this is what's going on. This is what NASA's doing. And then they release this stuff to the public. This uh, is from the Cassini probe. This is Titan. Uh, it's, I, I don't even believe that this is here, first of all, okay? There's definitely something behind it that's emitting all types of light. Now, if you can tell me how this is not... Look, they just covered part of it. I don't even believe that this is... I believe that this is just cut in. It's too much of a perfect circle. They used like a circle tool and just cut this out and pasted it, as far as I'm concerned. But this nonsense, this is what I mean when I tell you that NASA's blacking something out. This is so while we all went about our lives yesterday, we came very close to a catastrophic event here on planet Earth and we didn't know about it. It turns out we just missed getting hit by an asteroid, a piece of solid rock roughly the size of a 10-story building. Now I say just missed because it came within 45,000 miles of us. That's a lot closer than the moon is and scientists say way too close for something that big. Had it struck, again they, the people who tell us about these things, say the impact could have had the force of a thousand Hiroshima strength atomic bombs over a huge area of the earth. There are quite a few theories about how the world might end. Uh, for example, it's been suggested that there could be a big solar storm which would take the world out. Well, we get solar storms from time to time um, and they're a bit troublesome if you're an astronaut. Indeed, not good news if you're an astronaut. But down here on Earth, we are protected by the Earth's magnetosphere, the effects of the magnetic field. And okay, solar storms